Hello and welcome to all the men and women of the West. I'm Joe here from East Macau, Stan. Hello and greetings. And we're back with more Dragon Hunts. I couldn't resist that. So Loster and Porthios treat Lorana like a lady of the night, verbally abuse her, and have taken to selling women and children and men and boys for just about any kind of reason in their lands of exile, and have abandoned the Qualinesti to perish in Qualinesti. Lorana, seeing how evil her father and brother are, decide, ah, eh, screw it, I'm leaving. Which, yeah. Yeah, fair. Lorana's right. We criticize her for her actions in Spring Dawning, which are blatantly dumb. But you know what? When you consider those actions and what Parthios and Solosteran do on a regular basis, and how they nearly turn the Salamnic Knights into enemies, it'd be a positive compared to leaving this looming threat behind them as they're trying to deal with the Dragon High Lord's army. Lorana's the genius in the family. She may be many ways naive and trusting and gullible, but she's not full. Arguably the smartest member of the family is Gelthanus by a long shot. Tannis, technically he's a distant cousin because his mom is descended from Kif Kanan, but from the distaff line through the female line. That said, Gilthanus in the next chapter admits to himself that he did at one point hate Tannis, but he's since come to like him. And yeah, he no longer despises Tannis. He's really fond of him and actually admires him. Good on him. There was a lot to admire about Tannis. He initially didn't really like other races, except for the odd humans, because he did kind of like them. He's now actually actually growing weirdly fond of non-elves and even kind of admiring Raceland for his courage and knowledge of magic, even though he admits to himself, Raceland kind of scares him, which, okay, yeah, Raceland has that effect on people, given how power-hungry Raceland is. We tend to defend Raceland because from a certain point of view, most of the companions are jerks to him. Raceland is a really impressive guy. On the other hand, he is a freaking scary. He's as charming as a rock to the face. He's got negatives and charisma. Let's just put it that way. Gilthanus, though, is confused by what he's feeling for Silvara only to find that he's in love with her. And it's love at first sight, apparently. Silvara is filled with self-pity and cries at the end. Lorana decides to give the dragon orb to Derek as they're being hunted, which, fair. Now, there is a humorous scene where Gilthanus kind of is so enraptured by Silvara and her storytelling of the Legend of Huma that only Sturm is paddling their boat because she's too busy making googly eyes at Gilthanus. He's too busy making googly eyes at her. At which point, some of the Kagonesti, they kind of tease Gilthanus. The fact that he immediately apologizes to the Kaganesti and agrees to paddle has the Kaganesti pretty pleased with him. At which point he becomes a figure of mockery amongst them, an amusement. But the fact that he treats the Kaganesti elves with genuine reverence and respect and appreciation, and as though they're brothers, because this is the values of Qualanesti. The Qualanesti don't discriminate between the three races of elves, for which the Kaganesti are immediately filled with fondness and appreciation for Gilthanus and would die for him, because they recognize, okay, he has the values of Kif Kanan. So Vara, she ends up later using some magic when they're actually in a cavern shrine of sorts to the dragon lances to put the companions to sleep because it's past their bedtime. Tass, though, manages to avoid this fate and discovers Fizban, whom he then reminds of their, all their adventures, and Fizban kind of goes, oh, Fireball, that's a nice spell. Because, of course, the half-crazed lunatic does that. You know, I'm starting to think Pauline's genuinely a bit of a pyromaniac. Yeah, that would explain a lot. Because he is the father of dragons, and they're pyromaniacs. Fizban takes pity on Silvara, but makes her pull her spell away. You basically tempted Gilthanus and manipulated him, and you manipulated Manipulated his companions. Theros is given the secrets of Dragonlance crafting and agrees to craft Dragonlances. Gilthanus breaks down sobbing like a baby because everything that he was led to believe about Silvara is a lie. Silvara then realizes that by leading him on in the way she did and just doing nothing but lying to him, maybe this is not the strong foundation for a good relationship. At which point she reveals herself to be an imbecile and a silver dragon. While I do judge him for crying, I can't judge him for being a little upset and deciding that, yeah, this isn't true love. Because true love would not involve lies. So Vara tries to convince him subtly that it is love, but it's not because she lied to him. Gilthanus, I think, was genuinely smitten. As for chapter one of book three, it seems the Tannis team decide that they're going to become entertainers after Raceland uses some tricks to get out of trouble and they make a bit of money. Tika decides she's going to be a lady who takes her clothes off for money for the team. At which point the team says, sure, makes money, which turns them into skeevy 
jerks. I'm just saying this part of the writing is very unpleasant and it just makes me dislike this team. Gold Moon decides to become a singer. So she's basically singing between Tika's acts and Raceland's acts. This is all they're going to be doing for the rest of the book for the most part, which is dumb. Give them an adventure. So while Lorana and Sturm and their team are basically running for trouble and trying to do the right thing, the others are basically deciding to sell out Tika for money. Honestly, this part of the book needed a rewrite or three or 10. Time for chapter two of book three. It's revealed to us some of the organizational structure and customs of Salamia. There is a Grand Master, High Clarist, and a High Justice who are the heads of the Order of Salamia. And you have several other Knights of the Roses who help run the entire establishment. This is all revealed on page 255 and 256. But the trouble is that there is no Grand Master, High Justice, Lord Alfred Markennan. His hold over the position of High Justice is tenuous. So people are questioning whether or not he should even have the position. The acting Grand Master is Lord Gunther Uf Vistan, but he's not formally the Grand Master. So the knighthood is in disarray in a dark age, and they don't really have leadership. But the knight's trial is presided over by Gunther, and technically this is a trial prescribed by the measure, and the idea is that it's to determine whether Sturm will be knighted. And immediately the two other guys, Lord Alfred and Lord Michael Jeffrey, the guy filling in for the position of High Clarist, which is empty because it's been empty since the Cataclysm, because there are no clerics, both decide that though Derek, though he doesn't have any witnesses, Sturm's guilty of cowardice and other crimes. We should totally execute him and deny him his, his knighthood and strip him of his squireship. You kind of have Lord Gunther going, are you nuts? At which point th he's informed that Brightblade's only defense is to tell the knighthood that Derek is lying. And that that is unthinkable, even though it's the truth. And they all know that Derek's a liar. But to take the word of a squire over a knight of the rose is unthinkable. That actually makes sense. That does make sense. Sturm still has to be able to speak in his own defense. That is the law. Do either of you question it? And they're very, very angry about it. They don't like having to actually allow Sturm, you know, the right to self-defense in a court of law. Go figure. This is an unusual court case where a knight of the Rose is determined to destroy a squire who did nothing, fled from the enemy, but his reasons for claiming he fled was there were elves and that we were never in actual danger of death from them because, yeah, sure, they imprisoned us, but if they wanted to hit us with their arrows, we wouldn't be standing here. And that if we had attacked them, they would have actually fired to kill us. So the best thing to do was to run away because, you know what, they're not threatening us. They're not actually, but we're not actually in real danger. We don't stand to gain anything by fighting and we have to bring the Dragonor back to the knighthood. It takes priority over everything else. Makes sense to you and I, but doesn't make sense to a lot of knights. At which point, Lord Gunther asks Brightblade, how old are you? And Sturm is startled by this question. And you have Gunther, over 30, I believe. Yes, my lord. And from what Derek tells us about your exploits in Icewall Castle, a skilled warrior. I never denied that, my lord, Derek said, rising to his feet once again. His voice was tinged with impatience. Here's where you have Gunther who's like, okay, your case doesn't make any sense. Yet you accuse him of cowardice. If my memory serves me correctly. You stated that when the elves attacked, he refused to obey your order. Fight. And you have Derek. May I remind your lordship that I am not on trial. You charge Brightblade with cowardice in the face of the enemy. It has been many years since the elves were our enemies. And because there's an upcoming council of the White Stone, the knights are nervous. Even the most greedy and self-centered are going... Maybe not a good idea to end up in a war with Naraka, you know, the Dragon High Lord's army, and the elves at the same time. Might not go over well. Sure, we have the military might to completely crush either one, but we'd rather crush Naraka because, you know, they're evil and psychopathic and they want our lands and they will not negotiate with us. Sturm is pressed to answer whether or not Derek was telling the truth or not and to elaborate and he explains the, if the elves wanted them dead they'd already be dead and he says when he's pressed to answer my lord I do not say the knight has lied I say however that he has misrepresented me to what purpose Lord Michael asked Sturm hesitated I would prefer not to answer that my lord and then Lord Gunther insists Sturm again refuses to answer and then he, he begs not to be made to answer then he's commanded to answer wow it's taking a lot just to get Sturm just to defend himself it's it's at this point that Sturm clasps and unclasps his hands in front of him over on the table, looks directly at the three knights sitting in judgment of him, and realizes 
that his case is essentially lost. He was never allowed the chance to, to claim his knighthood, to even fight for it. This is actually also his test to become a full knight, but it's also his trial for his very life, or at least for his chance within the knighthood. And he just accepts that. Well, he gives up on the knighthood in this moment and decides he has to tell the truth. I believe Lord Derek Crownguard misrepresents me in an effort to further his own ambition, my lord. At that point, a tumult breaks out. Derek has to be restrained and challenges Sturm to a duel. Lord Gunther tells Derek that contests of honor are forbidden at this time as they are pretty much in a state of war. During war, Salamnic knights are not allowed to joust or fight to the death. Pretty smart custom. They should be united against a external enemy. And Sturm is ordered out of the hall and goes to pray. Then he's brought back in and two of the knights on the high council to storm out in a huff, enraged that Sturm was not stripped of everything and slain. I just say that they want to kill him because it's very clear that this is basically a trial for his very life. And it's revealed lore-wise that Berthil Brightblade, the founder of the clan, was the first one to receive the sword, Brightsword, the blade from which they know they have their name, and that the sword would only break if its master broke. Sturm, for his part, is found guilty, but his punishment is that he will never be able to draw payment from the coffers of the knighthood. Which, nobody's drawing payments from the knighthood, so it's moot. Lord Gunther decides to knight Sturm and declares that Sturm is to lead the knights of the crown, that division of the army, as third in command, Derek as his commanding officer, and Lord Alfred as second in command, to defend the High Clare's Tower. The thing is, this is done by Lord Gunther, who says, on my honor, and there is a universal gasp. And the reason for this is revealed later by Sturm that it is because if Sturm proves himself dishonorable in any way or a coward, Gunther will be stripped of all his lands, as will his wife, his sons, and they'll be chased out and pretty much exiled from Salamnia. That is something major. And Gunther does it without hesitation because he considers Sturm as his own son because Sturm is, it's implied, his godson. And he takes his duties to Sturm very seriously and claims, well, your father saved my life so many times. And Sturm says, and you did the same for him. Him. You owe him nothing. Pledging your honor for means that if I fail, you will suffer. You will be stripped of your rank, your title, your lands. Derek would see to that. And you have Lord Gunther then asks him, Have you failed in the past, Stern? No, my lord. I have not. I swear it. But I have no fear for the future. I pledge your good fortune in battle, Stern Brightblade. And he toasts Stern, because they're in private at this point, and Stern breaks down sobbing for the knighthood as he realizes that the knighthood is nothing more than a pack of politicians fighting and quarreling and trying to gut each other for the top position. That's what the knighthood has become. And that they care more for politics and drink and combat than anything else. And the realization that the knighthood has forgotten the measure and the oath breaks Stern, who cries himself to sleep. Honestly, probably one of the saddest parts in Dragonlance history, just when Stern snaps. Because Gunther then flashbacks to holding Angriff Brightblade when Angriff sent away his son in, into exile. And it's revealed that Angriff broke down crying for his wife and son, and that Gunther held him then. So this is two generations. Gunther probably feels like he failed. It's mind-blowingly sad. It's one of my favorite parts in the series. And Sturm, at the end of the chapter, takes off to leave for the High Clare's Tower. He thanks Lord Gunther, and Lord Gunther says farewell and embraces him quickly, as though he were his son, and turns and walks away, with Sturm climbing aboard a ship. Don't forget to smash that like and that subscribe button, as though you were Huma taking down Tachesis.